The Spitfire is now legendary. It first flew in 1936, but the story began 13 years earlier. In 1923, the Supermarine Company of Southampton prepared their Sea Lion 3 for the Schneider Trophy Contest. It was designed by the 28-year-old chief designer, R.J. Mitchell. The flying boat was powered by a Napier Lion engine of 550 horsepower. The Sea Lion 3 was not new, but a revised version of the aircraft which had won the race in Naples the year before at 145 miles per hour. In the 1923 event, despite an uprated engine, the supermarine flying boat was to be outclassed by the American Navy's Curtis CR-3. This small seaplane was most carefully streamlined and its metal propeller was driven by an exceptionally light and powerful engine. The 465 horsepower Curtis D-12, cast in aluminium, had a very low frontal area and set new standards in aero engine design. Mitchell's answer was the S-4 cantilever monoplane, one of the most beautiful aircraft yet built, and one which bore a distinct family likeness to its most famous descendant. On a test flight in 1925, Henri Biard took the S-4 up to 226 miles per hour, more than enough to win the trophy back, but the day before the race it crashed, possibly due to wing flutter. For the 1927 race, Supermarine built a smaller and tougher aircraft, the S-5, a more powerful Lion engine with smaller frontal area was fitted. The fuselage and floats were largely metal with wooden low-mounted wings, wire braced to prevent a repetition of the earlier mishap. The 1927 Schneider race in Venice was won by the S-5 at a record 281 miles per hour. The pilot was Flight Lieutenant Webster, the RAF having begun to recognize the importance of the contest. But the Napier Lion engine was at the end of its development. So Mitchell went to Henry Royce, who promised him an engine of at least 1,800 horsepower. Rolls-Royce was then producing a V12 called the Buzzard, a rather unsuccessful 36-litre engine, which only produced 825 horsepower. The task facing A.J. Rowledge, the engineer responsible, was simply expressed. He had to more than double the power output. Every moving part of the Buzzard had to be revised and strengthened to withstand the enormously increased stresses. The main bearings of the crankshaft, for example, had to bear a loading of nine tons. Within 11 months, the first six hand-built R engines were being meticulously assembled. To keep the weight as low as possible, extensive use was made of a Rolls-Royce alloy named high dominium. The exhaust valves were filled with sodium to help conduct the heat away from their heads, an innovation for Rolls-Royce. The 1800 horsepower could now be contained. Its source lay in the then new technology of supercharging. The centrifugal blower compressed the mixture to a manifold pressure of 13 pounds per square inch above atmospheric. And new anti-detonation fuels had to be researched. Petroleum chemists devised a brew of 78% benzol, 22% aviation spirit, and a trace of tetraethyl lead, which the supercharger fed to the engine at over three and a half gallons a minute. By careful attention to the crankcase and valve covers, the R engine had a remarkably low frontal area for a 36-litre V12. In May 1929, the engine was placed on the test bench. The transformation from the 900-horsepower buzzard that Rolls-Royce could not sell to the R engine that could win the Schneider Trophy was complete. The test runs were staggering. 1,900 horsepower from an engine which weighed only 1,500 pounds. No existing engine could compete. As the engines were being tested in Derby, at Southampton, the new S6 was ready for the first of the special power plants. To reduce drag, the fuselage was as narrow as possible, the maximum width being that of the supercharger. It was a tight fit, 
And rather than lose the advantage of such low frontal drag with conventional radiators, Mitchell had devised a novel cooling system. Most of the wing surfaces were used to dissipate the great heat of the engine. And this meant putting the 160-gallon fuel tanks into the floats, which also improved stability during the takeoff. Very large quantities of oil were used too. The tank was in the fin where some heat could be lost, and the oil circulated through radiators along the seaplane's sides. Thus the problem of cooling the 1900 horsepower engine was solved with the minimum of drag. The question posed was, would it all work in practice? The S6 was larger and heavier than the S5, but at Calchart the team was confident it could meet the challenge of the scarlet-painted Italian Mackies. The S6 was by far the most efficient seaplane yet built. It was also the most advanced, being of stressed skin construction. Promptly at 2 p.m. on the 7th of September, the 1929 Schneider Trophy contest started. Flying officer Waghorn's S6 won the race at an average speed of 328 miles per hour. The Italian Mackies had engine trouble and two were forced to alight before the finish. Two years later, the operated S6B became the first aircraft in the world to exceed 400 miles per hour in level flight. It won the Schneider Trophy outright for Britain. In the early 30s, more importance was attached to maneuverability than to sheer speed, and the Bristol Bulldogs of 43 Squadron, based here at Northolt and part of London's air defences, could do no more than 174 miles per hour. The S6B touched down at 110, yet the Bulldog was to remain a front-line RAF fighter until 1936. There were some immediate advances from the experience gained during the trophy races. The air-cooled Bristol Jupiter radial, powering the Bulldog, used a supercharger developed for the 1927 race, and alloy heads were fitted. It was clear, too, that higher-octane fuels would soon be needed. The Bristol Bulldog, though it had a metal structure, was a wire-braced, fabric-covered biplane, only 42 miles per hour faster than the SE-5A that had fought over the trenches in 1918. This aircraft was one of a batch of 17 two-seaters used to convert pilots to the type. But by 1933, the squadrons had started to re-equip with the slim, powerful, liquid-cooled inline engines, which became almost standard for RAF fighters. These Hawker Demons, designed by Sidney Cam, were a two-seat fighter variant of the Hart Light Bomber, which in the 1930 air exercises had shocked the air staff by outperforming the defending interceptors. Both types used the 550 horsepower Rolls-Royce Kestrel V12, which had a good deal in common with the R-type. These are 15 squadrons hearts in 1935. Now only the disappointing Goshawk lay between Rolls-Royce and the best piston engine they ever built. Goshawk and Kestrel were both tested in Cam's 200 mile an hour fury. Only the Kestrel worked well. Nevertheless, Supermarine designed the 224 fighter around the Goshawk, believing that the problems of the more powerful engine could be solved. Mitchell was now convinced that the future lay with monoplanes. Unfortunately, in competition with five different biplanes, Supermarine's all metal monoplane performed badly. The wing and undercarriage fairings housed a complicated pressurized engine cooling system to avoid the drag of external radiators, but it failed to cool the 600 horsepower Goshawk and the project was abandoned. For the last time, the rugged reliability of the radial engine biplane won the day. The Gloucester Gladiator, though a delight to fly, hardly reflected the technical advances made with the S6 at the beginning of the decade although it impressed the public at air displays. In Germany, a more convincing demonstration of technological advance was being carefully stage-managed. In March 1939, a Heinkel 100 with specially prepared Daimler-Benz engine took off from Oranienburg to attack the world speed record. The small plane flashed round the course 
and lands after the attempt. Its 23-year-old pilot, Hans Dieterler, being certain he'd broken the record. He had, at over 463 miles per hour. Despite the record and celebrations, the Heinkel didn't go into production for political reasons, but it represented all the lessons of a decade of progress. To meet the growing challenge of the Luftwaffe, three new monoplane fighters were ordered for the RAF. The first, but not quite the most famous, was the Hawker Hurricane, powered by the new Rolls-Royce PV-12. The prototype first flew in 1935. The Bolton Paul Defiant was the second of the new fighters. It was an updated two-seater with a power-operated four-gun turret. In early 1940, it was highly successful, being often mistaken for a hurricane. But it had no forward armament, and once German pilots realized this, its loss rate would become unacceptable. The third, the Spitfire, was the fighter which was destined to epitomize the spirit of a nation at war. It was first flown at Eastley, near Southampton, on the 6th of March, 1936, the pilot being Mutt Summers. At that time, the aircraft was simply known as F-37-34. No one can now say when the name Spitfire was officially adopted. The chief designer, Reginald Mitchell, was then desperately ill with cancer. He would not live to see his aeroplane fight, but the experience gained with the Schneider seaplanes and the 224, together with the then new PB-12 Rolls-Royce engine, provided an exceptionally beautiful and efficient fighter, which must surely, even on those early test flights, have convinced him that he'd created a great aircraft. Though it's doubtful if Mitchell or indeed anyone else present could have foreseen just how great the Spitfire was soon to prove to be. Mitchell died in 1937, and the chief draftsman, Joseph Smith, would see the Spitfire into production. A year's design work went into adapting the structure of the prototype into one that could be readily produced. The Spitfire was the first British all-metal stressed skin aircraft to be put into quantity production. It was not, when compared with the fabric-covered Hurricane, an easy airframe to construct. The workforce available to Supermarine was only 500. And in addition to the Spitfire, the firm was also building Walrus and Stranra flying boats. The Spitfire, in common with other wartime aircraft, was largely hand-built in mass production numbers. The first contract was for 310 aircraft at 4,500 pounds each. The alloy skin was flush riveted to reduce drag and formed a light, immensely strong, rigid airframe capable of withstanding 10G. Final assembly of the early Spitfires was at Eastley. It was very much a manual operation, the major units being hand-fitted, relying on the accuracy of the jigs and a high standard of manufacture. In 1938, the all-male labor force was composed of skilled craftsmen who'd served long apprenticeships, a situation which the war would radically change. The fighter was built around Rolls-Royce's PV-12, which was now named the Merlin. The assembly is inspected, the systems checked, and as one Spitfire is completed, another starts on the line. The first RAF squadron to equip with Spitfires, number 19, received its aircraft in June 1938. And a new shape was seen over the English countryside during those last months of peace. time war had broken out in September 1939, nine RAF fighter squadrons were flying Spitfires, and as they sped overhead, small boys could look up and confidently say, it's a Spit. In early 1940, to train its airmen, the RAF made a film of the Spitfire's daily inspection routine, which fortunately has survived. A Mark I taxis in. The pilot's visibility from a Spitfire on the ground is severely limited by the engine. The airmen are required to guide the machine as it approaches the hangars and other parked aircraft.
When this aircraft was engaged in the Battle of Britain a few weeks later, the refueling and rearming would be a good deal less measured and leisurely. After topping up the 84-gallon fuel tanks, the Spitfire is manhandled into a hangar. In 1940, operational fighters would have been serviced on the airfield, only going into the hangars for major work. A number of skilled tradesmen are needed, even for a daily inspection. They're all RAF servicemen, and at this early stage of the war, probably regulars who'd been trained on biplanes. An airframe rigger tests the wheel brakes, which are operated by compressed air at 200 pounds per square inch. the fabric-covered tail control surfaces, the rudder and elevators, which the rigger tests for full, free and correct movement. The ailerons, too, are checked. It was not unknown for these vital controls to be connected in reverse after major overhaul. The rigger is operating the elevator trim wheel. This secondary flight control moves small trim tabs on the elevator, which enable the pilot to adjust for hands-off flight compensating for nose or tail heaviness as the power changes. The rudder bar is moved to the limit of its travel and the bias is checked. The Spitfire 1's landing flaps, like the brakes, are operated by compressed air and can only be either fully down or up. The wheels are normally retracted by hydraulic power from an engine-driven pump, but this lever releases an emergency supply of carbon dioxide to the undercarriage. The radio on early Spitfires was tuned mechanically by a cable linkage from this control box. This Spitfire is fitted with the TR-9 HF radio, which was standard throughout the Battle of Britain. Many TR-9s were fitted with Pipsqueak, an automatic timer which switched on the transmitter for 14 seconds in each minute to enable DF stations to track individual aircraft. HF radio was to remain in service until late in 1940, when a VHF set, the TR-1143, was issued. The next tradesman to appear is the instrument mechanic. A pilot's life depended on his instruments. The mechanic adjusts the zero of the Spitfire's rate of climb indicator. Although calibrated to 4,000 feet per minute, Spitfire 1's best climb was 2,500 feet per minute. The altimeter is set to QFE, the local barometric pressure, to read zero on that airfield on that day. The central standard blind flying panel, common to all RAF aircraft, is mounted on anti-vibration springs. The undercarriage warning horn is tested, this blows automatically if aircraft attempt to land with wheels up. The ethylene glycol coolant tank is checked, as is the pilot's oxygen supply, the total oxygen and rate of supply being constantly metered. Once oxygen became a standard fitting, it didn't take long for aircrew to discover that a few deep breaths of it were an instant cure for a hangover. The mechanic checks the time, adjusts the clock, and winds it. The 5.8 gallon oil tank is topped up. Another airman cleans and checks the undercarriage well. When this film was shot just before the Battle of Britain, the reflector sight was still top secret. The instrument mechanic tests the brightness control of the internal lamp on which the sight depended. Three spare bulbs are carried in the cockpit. The Spitfire 1 had a control to enable the pilot to lower landing lights fitted under each wing. These powerful lights could also be moved up and down by the pilot, this refinement disappeared on later marks, since Spitfires proved unsuitable for night fighting. The fitter ensures that the fuel filler cap is secure. 
Next, the fuel gauges for the two internal tanks. One contained 48, the other 37 imperial gallons. The airman then checks and cleans the engine radiator intake. In the cockpit, an airframe rigger operates the shutter which controls the radiator temperature. The Form 700 is signed. The daily inspection is complete. This Spitfire bears the code of number 609, West Riding Squadron. 609 was to be heavily engaged in the Battle of Britain, based at Middle Wallop and Warmwell. This unique film was shot in early June 1940 at number 6 maintenance unit, Rise Norton. The Spitfire is pushed past a parked Miles Master trainer and an early hurricane onto the large grass airfield. The light weight, 5,820 pounds of the Spitfire 1, is evident from the easy way the five-man handling crew turned the aircraft into wind for an engine run-up. The Spitfire required 2,400 rounds of 303-inch ammunition for its eight Browning guns. Belts are made up with either armor piercing, incendiary or ball ammunition. The last 25 rounds were usually tracer to warn the pilot he was running out. Each gun had a 300 round belt which was loaded into a box magazine. As soon as the fighters landed after action, as soon as the propellers stopped turning, the ground crews were at work. While the aircraft refueled, beneath the wings, the armorers are removing the spent magazines from their stowage. Then they clean the barrels with the traditional four by two inch patch of flannelette, leaving the guns clean, bright and slightly oiled. The oxygen bottles too are changed by the armourers. Fresh 300 round ammunition magazines are brought to the aircraft. Using a length of webbing, the belts are fed through the gun breeches. This simple device enabled the armourers to rearm a Spitfire in less than 10 minutes instead of the original 20 since they no longer had to remove the eight access panels on the upper surfaces of the wings. The guns are cocked and the access panels replaced using the patent fastening. As any ex-armorer or rigger will recall, not all panels went back as easily as this one. The Spitfire is now armed and ready to fight. August the 13th, 1940, was to the Germans the start of Arbe Angriffe, Eagle Attack. The British recognized the same date as the start of the Battle of Britain. The order to the three attacking German air fleets was simple, destroy the RAF. As the JU-88s took off to attack Portsmouth Harbor, RAF airfields and the radar stations, the Luftwaffe High Command confidently expected the battle to end in a total German victory within two weeks at the outside. There was ample reason for the Luftwaffe's confidence. They had already defeated the Polish and French air forces. They now had no fewer than 3,500 aircraft ranged against the RAF's 1,065 fighters. But the German order of battle included the obsolescent Dornier 17s, which had performed well enough in Spain and against moderate fighter opposition over Poland and France. Now, their defensive armament was to prove woefully inadequate. Also prominent were large numbers of Messerschmitt 110, twin-engine destroyer fighters, whose task was to entice the British fighters into battle and shoot them down. The 110, though heavily armed with forward-firing cannon, was slow, cumbersome, and poorly armed against stern attack. The ME-109E was the main opponent of the Spitfires and Hurricanes. This one is flown by the Luftwaffe ace Adolf Galland, then the CO of the fighter wing, JG-26. The 109E was faster than the Hurricane, the equal of the Spitfire. With its fuel-injected engine and cannon armament, it was a deadly fighter. Massed formations of German bombers attacked each and every day during that hot, long summer of 1940.
Day after day, throughout the summer of 1940, the fighters that survived the battles returned to their small grass airfields in southern England. By the end of October, it was clear that the RAF had, by the narrowest of margins, contained the greatest air force the world had yet seen. Fewer than a thousand young RAF pilots had fought the battle. 451 of them were dead. 915 of their aircraft lost. The Germans, who'd fought bravely too against mounting losses, had, according to the Luftwaffe's own post-war figures, lost 1,733 aircraft, mainly bombers, to the fighter pilots of the RAF. The invasion of Britain, the reason for the battle, was postponed indefinitely. The public responded to the victory by contributing to Spitfire funds. Children collected fruit to sell and the pennies, shillings and pounds mounted. The price of a Spitfire had been fixed at 5,000 pounds. Actually, they then cost nearly twice that figure. But in the first two months of 1941 alone, 10 million pounds had been donated. By the war's end, some 900 Spitfires had been presented. On the 26th of September, the supermarine factories at Woolston and Itchen were bombed. Though the buildings were destroyed, the vital machine tools were still intact. Immediately, production was dispersed into the surrounding area, into sheds, garages and laundries. Some turning out small components, others complete aircraft. So successful was the dispersal that probably fewer than 90 Spitfires were lost as a result of the bombing. Mass production by semi-skilled workers was previously unknown in the aircraft industry. But now men from the motor industry and women, some of whom had never worked in factories before, were drafted into the vast new aeroplane works which Morris Motors built at Castle Bromwich. The new labour force concentrated on making basic components, while Vickers management transferred skilled supermarine men to tackle the operations which could not be adapted to motor industry methods and to train the new workers. Castle Bromwich built all the 920 Mark IIs and over 5,000 Mark IX's eventually producing nearly 12,000 Spitfires of all marks between January 1940 and the end of the war, mostly with locally recruited and trained labour. At the end of the line, the armament is fitted. Until 1941, almost every Spitfire had been armed with four 303 Browning machine guns in each wing. This arrangement of the eight guns became known as the A-wing. Removable flush-fitting panels in the upper surfaces gave access to the breaches, and the 300 round boxes of ammunition for each gun were fitted from below. Although the aircraft carried 2,400 rounds, the weight of shot from a typical burst was only eight pounds, which proved inadequate. So the two inboard 303s were replaced by a 20 mm Hispano cannon under a bulged fairing, which was detachable, like the gun panels. Spitfires with the B-wing gun arrangement carried 600 rounds of 303 ammunition in the outer bays and 120 rounds for the cannon. Most Mark Vs were fitted with the universal or C-type wing. The designation referred only to the gun arrangements. The wing itself might be normal, occasionally extended or clipped. The armament in each wing was either four 303 Browning machine guns or two Brownings and a 20mm Hispano cannon, which was now belt-fed with 120 rounds. Alternatively, the newfound reliability of the Hispano allowed the C-wing to be armed, if required, with two 20mm cannon by removing all the machine guns. The C-type universal wing was fitted to a number of later marks. The Mark V, which the factories were turning out in large numbers by the beginning of 1941, was the first major revision of the original design. Basically, it was a Mark I, strengthened to withstand the greater power of the Rolls-Royce Merlin 45. It was faster than the Mark I and could fly to 38,000 feet. By the end of the year, almost all the day fighter squadrons were equipped with Mark Vs. The squadron armourers now had a new gun and ammunition to deal with, the cannon. The heavier ammunition is loaded into 60 round drum magazines, one per gun. Each shell is checked and carefully inserted. A damaged or incorrectly loaded round could jam the cannon. 
The magazines for the B Wing's 303 Brownings were now of a later type, containing 350 rounds per gun. After a sortie, the rearming of the cannon arm Spitfire 5s, unlike the Mark 1s, required the armourers to work above and below the wings. First, the access panels over the 303 Brownings are removed and the breeches examined. This one is in the forward position, which indicates that this gun has run out of ammunition. The second armourer removes the underwing panels for access to the magazine. The blister covering the cannon breech is removed. This armourer has his screwdriver on a lanyard, it being all too easy with frozen fingers to drop it, losing vital time. Working as a team, the armourers next pull the Browning breech blocks to the rear position in order to clear the ammunition belts. A special tool is used in this official film. In practice, armourers often use their forage caps. The cannon cocking valve is opened so that the empty magazine may be removed. Another magazine is changed, that of the G42 16mm Cine gun camera, which automatically filmed when the guns were fired. After combat, the film was studied to check claimed kills. The larger bore of the cannon needed eight sections of the famous 4x2 flannelette on the pull-through. Breaches and ammunition feeds are all cleaned and lightly oiled. A loaded cannon magazine is carefully fitted and secured. The drag-producing bulges were to remain on all cannon-armed Spitfires, a legacy of the original design, which had not foreseen such heavy armament. The 303s have been rearmed and the panels are replaced. Armourers are also responsible for the very recognition cartridges in the coded colours of the day. Finally, self-adhesive fabric patches are stuck over the gun ports to prevent mud entering on takeoff from grass airfields and to keep the guns from freezing at altitude. The cannon too require protective measures to keep them out of trouble. The bulletproof windscreen and the reflector sight are polished and checked. The fighter pilot had to be a first-class shot, but first he had to judge the range of the enemy. The reflector gun sight was designed to help him do so, for when an aircraft the size of an ME-109 filled the ring, it was 100 yards away. When it appeared equal to half the diameter, it was 200 yards away. Knowing the sizes of the other German types, the pilot could quickly judge their ranges. He estimated the span of the target and turned a knurled wheel to that setting. He then adjusted a second knob to the estimated range. This varied the gap between the two lines in the sight, and when the target filled the gap, it was at the optimum range. Although the bullets left the guns at over twice the speed of sound, this velocity rapidly dropped off. And because the guns vibrated a little as they fired, the bullets spread out into a cone-shaped pattern. The eight-gun Spitfire would fire about 480 rounds in a typical three-second burst but at 400 yards, the density of hits would be no more than seven or eight per square foot. As well as slowing down and spreading out with range, bullets drop due to gravity, over five feet at 400 yards. So the armourers carefully adjusted the guns and the reflector sight so that they harmonised and the cones of fire would converge, usually about 250 yards ahead. Careful pilots checked their work. An enemy fighter flying at 300 miles an hour travelled 36 yards in the quarter of a second it took for the 303 bullets to reach it. In a beam attack, the pilot would have to aim 36 yards in front of the target to hit him. But more usually, the angle between the two aircraft was much less than 90 degrees, and the ability to make the instinctive judgement of this angle and this target speed was one of the main factors separating the aces from the others. Ender's practice with charts like this familiarised inexperienced pilots with the appearance of German aircraft at different angles and from all likely attacking positions. The Spitfire pilot manoeuvred his aircraft so that targets 20 degrees off just touched the ring and were pointing towards the dot on which the guns were directed. Targets 10 degrees off were placed halfway between the ring and dot. At 5 degrees off, 
they should be even nearer the dot center. The Messerschmitt in this diagram is correctly positioned in the ring. But this shot will miss. By 1942, the much improved gyro gun sight was introduced. It retained the familiar ring and dot as a standby, but had a second ring of six diamond-shaped dots projected on the screen beside it. The diameter of this ring was controllable by the pilot, who twisted the throttle grip until this pattern just circled the span of the target. The sight automatically computed the range and deflection of the enemy, even in a tight turn. By mid-1941, having secured air superiority at home, Aria Fighter Command was able to go on to the offensive. Blenheim night bombers were briefed to attack targets in northern Europe, the object being to draw the German fighters into battle with the Spitfire escorts. The Spitfire had been designed as a short-range interceptor fighter, carrying all its fuel internally. As it became necessary for them to operate further and further from their bases, 30-gallon slipper tanks were fitted, which were jettisoned when the enemy was sighted. As the formation approached the enemy coast, German radar would scramble the ME-109s. To oppose the new Spitfires, a new messagement, the 109F. It was armed with a single 20mm Mauser cannon, firing through the airscrew spinner, and twin MG-17 machine guns, synchronized to fire through the propeller arc. As soon as enemy fighters were sighted, the bomber escorts turned to attack, while other Spitfires dived on the German fighters. The 109F and the Spitfire 5 were well matched. However, sheer weight of numbers enabled the Spitfires to shoot down a number of 109s. But about to make its entrance was one of the great fighters of the Second World War, the Focke-Wulf 190. Powered by a 14-cylinder BMW radial engine, of 1,440 horsepower, the FW-190 had a maximum speed of 408 miles per hour. Spitfire 5 was outclassed. Mark 5s were modified by removing the wingtips to reduce drag and by fitting a smaller impeller, which reduced the power demands of the blower. The result was the faster LF-5, which could equal the 190, but only at low altitude. At Rolls-Royce, it was appreciated that the low-flying Spitfire was only an interim measure. But as before, Rolls had developed an engine which was to provide a more lasting solution. A new supercharger had been fitted to give bombers a better high-altitude performance. If the longer engine could be fitted into the Spitfire, it would transform the fighter. A preserved Mark IX shows how it was done. The nose of the Mark V was lengthened and the engine fitted tightly under the cowling. To absorb the greater power, a four-bladed propeller was fitted. Beneath the oil tank, the air intake, which was increased in area. But the main recognition feature was the addition of a second radiator under the port wing. This was the main engine cooler and it now had automatic shutters. The other radiator was connected to a heat exchanger on top of the engine, which cooled the highly compressed petrol-air mixture. Air was forced into the twin-choke carburetors by the forward speed of the aircraft. The two impellers boosted the mixture pressure. The intercooler halved its temperature and a powerful charge reached the cylinders. The 1700 horsepower 61 was 70% more powerful than the original Merlin giving the Nine a top speed of over 400 miles per hour. Yet, it was still unmistakably Mitchell Spitfire. The Mark IX Spitfire was the first to be fitted with a new gun arrangement, known as the E-Wing. In the outer bay was fitted a 20mm Hispano, and beside it was a new heavier caliber 0.5-inch Browning machine gun. Both were belt-fed, and a total of about 740 rounds was carried. In May 1942, the RAF captured an airworthy FW-190A. Experts minutely examined the German aircraft. It was then extensively flown against a Spitfire 9 in mock combat, the conclusion being that the two fighters were evenly matched, an opinion that was to be borne out in actual combat. By the end of 1943, 
Joe Smith knew that with the 60 series, the Merlin was at the end of its development. A new Rolls-Royce engine, the 37-litre, 2,000-horsepower Griffin, was fitted to the Spitfire 12s and 14s. Just in time to counter the menace of the V-1 flying bomb. The Mark V's, now outclassed in Northern Europe, were still in frontline service overseas. To ferry aircraft to distant commands, drop tanks of either 90 or 170 gallon capacity were fitted. 367 Spitfires were flown from carriers 800 miles to the besieged island of Malta. In North Africa, Sicily and Italy, as the Allied armies advanced, Spitfire Fives fitted with tropical air filters flew constant sorties to support the armies on the ground. Although the large air filter reduced their performance slightly, without them engines would have been worn out in a matter of hours. The Spitfire Five was the first mark to be capable of carrying bombs up to 500 pounds. Thus armed, Spitfires successfully attacked transports and pinpoint targets at very low level, a role never envisaged by R.J. Mitchell. When one considers that many of these aircraft were converted Mark Ones, the excellence of the original design and construction is apparent. In 1943, the wheel turned full circle as three Spitfire Fives converted into seaplanes were test flown in Egypt, recalling the Schneider Trophy 12 years earlier. There was another nautical role for the Spitfire. Six squadrons of Mark IIs were used for air-sea rescue, dropping dinghies to downed aircrew, who were picked up by a supermarine walrus. The walrus, known to the service as the Shankbat, was a distant cousin of the Spitfire, being a descendant of Mitchell's sea lion. Spitfires have been used for photo reconnaissance from Mark Ones to the widely used PR-11. This 11, serving with a Canadian unit, is loaded with its oblique F-24 camera, set 13 degrees downwards. The PR-11 had a range of 1,340 miles, which required the oil tank to be enlarged to 13 gallons. This, one of the great PR shots of the war, revealed the existence of the German radar at Brunewald. This photograph of the Myrna Dam, after the famous raid, was taken from a PR-11 of 542 Squadron. Vertical cameras shot through two ports beneath the fuselage. The cameras were offset to provide overlap coverage. The Griffin Engine 19 was the final PR Spitfire. The Spitfire proved remarkably adaptable. There was one role, however, in which it was to prove flawed, as a naval carrier-borne fighter. In June 1941, the Seafire II, a naval version of the Spitfire V, entered service with the fleet air arm. Seafires participated in Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of North Africa, and also supported the landings at Salerno in September of 1943. It would, however, be fair to say that when compared with the excellent American fleet fighters, the Seafire was at a disadvantage. It was a land plane derivative and its frail, narrow track undercarriage and poor visibility on the approach rendered it distinctly tricky to operate from carriers. In late 1944, operating from captured airfields, Griffin engined Spitfire 14s take off. These aircraft were among the last Spitfires to operate in the European war. The development of the Spitfire over 13 years of continuous production was matched by Rolls-Royce's achievement with the Merlin and Griffin engines. The story is reflected in the changing outline of the aircraft. The Merlin III only gave 890 horsepower at takeoff. An improved supercharger gave the Merlin 45 nearly 350 horsepower more, which the tropical filter slightly reduced. The two-stage supercharger doubled the power at altitude and gave the Mark 9 just over 400 miles per hour. The Griffin engine was 9 meters larger, but frontal area only increased 6%. Adding a two-stage supercharger lengthened the nose of the Griffin engine 14 and PR 19. Over 2,000 horsepower propelled the Mark 22 to 450 miles per hour. The fin and rudder of the Spitfire changed too to contain the increased torque and to maintain stability. 
The area of the tailplane remained unaltered until the very heavy Mark 22. From first to last, the wartime Spitfires appeared unmistakably Spitfires. There were eventually no less than 32 distinctly different Spitfires and nine marks of Seafire, not to speak of innumerable field modifications and adaptations, propelled by many different versions of the two principal engines, the Merlin and the Griffin. Yet the fundamental soundness of Mitchell's design, particularly the design of the thin, strong wing, which remained the same in outline and basic construction until the Marks 21 and 22 of 1944, stamps every variant with his particular engineering genius. Of the 18,298 Merlin engine Spitfires produced, very few now remain airworthy. This is one of them. Its hours are carefully husbanded, and only a very select band of pilots allowed the privilege of flying it. Before takeoff, the pilot checks the aircraft visually. The creep marks are in line, no cuts on the tyres. The four-bladed propeller has no nicks or fluid leaks. The condition of the elevators is carefully examined. Any distortion will make the Spitfire very difficult to control. The rudder must have full, unrestricted movement. Trim tab neutral and hinge play satisfactory. The radio hatch is secure. The aircraft appears to be airworthy. The pilot climbs into the cockpit. It is narrow, and pilots really require the assistance of a fitter to sort out the standard RAF harness. The seats adjusted to give maximum visibility and clearance for the hood, should it have to be jettisoned. The parachute harness is snapped into the quick release box. As in wartime fighters, the pilot sits on the parachute pack, which forms an exceedingly unyielding cushion. Flying gloves are donned to give a secure grip on the controls. The gloves are thin enough to operate small switches, thick enough to give some protection from a cockpit fire. Indicator switch on, undercarriage selector down. Fuel, 37 gallons in the lower tank. Pilot's door shut and latched. Hood open for takeoff and locked. Final check, full, free and correct movement. Rudder bias wound to fully right for takeoff to counter the Spitfire swing due to torque. Elevator trim with half fuel is set one division nose down. The ground accumulator is plugged in, ready for engine starting. Air pressure sufficient. Brakes on. Parking catch locked on. Fuel cock on. Starter and booster coil buttons uncovered. Magneto switches off. Throttle set, half an inch open. Propeller constant speed control, fully forward. Idle cutoff checked fully aft. The wobble pumps operated to pressurize the fuel lines until the fuel pressure warning light is out. The Kai gas primer is unscrewed. On a cold day, up to seven strokes are needed. The two ignition switches are switched on. Contact. Magnetos both check live. Oil pressure rising, fuel pressure warning light off. Run up engine slowly, stick hard back or the aircraft could nose over. Engine run up to zero boost, exercising propeller constant speed unit. Check for magneto drop, engine run up satisfactory. Pressures and temperatures okay. Call tower for takeoff clearance.
nearly 50 years after the first flight, a small number of preserved Spitfires perpetuate the legend of this, the most famous of fighters.